What's going on, people? We are Tottenham TV back here for another Tottenham update for you guys today. If you are new around here, we are also on podcasting platforms, particularly Spotify, Apple Podcasts soon to come, as well as written content as well on wearetottenhamtv.com. But let's get straight in to the update. And we're going to start on Pedro Neto once again, as the Mail were reporting that Pedro Neto is set to leave Wolves this summer to help the club meet their FFP rules. Tottenham are keen to do business and bring Neto to North London this summer with with Ange Postacoglu said to be a big fan of the winger. I mean, we've spoken a lot about him over the past week or so. I think we've both said, you know, these injury problems are an issue. Uh, hopefully he can get through them. And if he goes from now to the end of the season without injury issues, I think, you know, this one could definitely be a goer. Um, but Spurs do like kind of taking advantage of these teams going through FFP problems. You look at Brennan Johnson in the summer. You look at Richarlison in the summer before. Are we going to make it a hat-trick with Pedro Neto this summer? I hope so. I think we should we should be throwing our weight around. I think we should be taking advantage of the fact that we are in a very strong position when it comes to FFP because of the way Daniel Levy has run the club over the 23 years of, of his tenureship. You know, being very uh, frugal with his money, making sure we're not outspending our limits. And now <laughs> we're sitting here with an amazing stadium which is a money making machine with concerts f1 all that kind of stuff so with a number of teams now in the premier league struggling to comply with ffp and in real big risk of um, breaching the ffp rules like everton and nottingham forest um they now are in a position that if they do want to spend any money in the summer they have to sell um you know a big player to kind of fund that so i think spurs should definitely be taking advantage of that and especially when it comes to a player like pedro neto who i feel is a perfect kind of player for Tottenham. I think he's young. He's an amazing winger. He can play on the left or the right equally as good. I think he's an outstanding talent. I think he's shown this season that even with his injuries, he's getting better and better, which is a very rare thing, I feel. Usually when you've had such big injuries like a player like he has, it takes you a while to kind of get back to your best form and then you can start, uh, you know, improving. But it's a weird thing. This season, he's like just come back like better than ever. Like he's be better than he's ever been. And that, I think, maybe shows um, shows me how a player like him is going to react to when he, did get, when he does get injured and what an amazing talent he is. And I don't know how much it will take to get him out. I just remember in the past few years, they've sold Neves for about 45 million. They sold Nunes for about 45 million. I, I think in if they didn't have the FFP problems, you know, you're talking about uh, a winger in this market that's close to, you know, considering he's 23, you know, you're probably talking about close to 80 million. Um, but with the FFP issues, they might have to take a bit less than that. So I, I do wonder how much. Yeah, I reckon 60 does a Maybe job. Uh, 50 plus add-ons. Well, wow. look, we've, we've got players that, you know, that maybe not surplus to requirements, but we've got players that will definitely do well at Wolves and probably that, that players that Wolves would be interested in. I know he hasn't been here for too long, but I was saying to you off air before, why don't we try and make them a deal of Manuel Solomon plus some cash? You know, he's a player that we got for free. And if we bring in Neto, he falls further down the pecking order at Tottenham. So why not try like a Manuel Solomon plus plus 50 million or something like that? I think that's, yeah. a, that's a fair deal. Maybe a skip. Maybe something. I don't think Hoybe will want to go there, so I don't think he's on the table. I don't think Emerson will probably want to go there either. But maybe someone like a Skip, yeah, maybe like someone like a Solomon. If we if we tell Solomon, I don't know if there's a future here for you. I mean, that would be harsh considering he's only played a handful of games and he's been injured. And you know, would be signing him on a three year, four year deal. So I don't think will Solomon want to give up on his Spurs dream so quickly. I don't know. But if we kind of tell him. I don't know if it's right that you that that you uh, stay in the squad. Maybe he'll be convinced, but I feel bad for Manuel because he did have a bright start. I don't think he was like unbelievable, but he had a bright start to his Spurs career, and he picked up an injury. So he came here like as his big move to a you know big North London club um, with a you know big Jewish following, which you know he would he he was really excited about. So I don't know after a year where he maybe feels like he hasn't shown he what he can do. Would he just want to you know cut his losses and leave? I yeah, don't know. I get that, but. Is Manuel Solomon ever going to be of the kind of potential and the quality that someone like Pedro Neto is? I don't think so. I don't think anyone thinks so. And as much as I like Manuel, as much as I like what he brings to the team, and I would like him to stick around as a squad player, I think he's a really good option to have off the bench. If we can use him as as like a make weight to bring in someone like a Neto or even someone else, um, I think it would be a great option to have. Seeing as we did bring him in on a free transfer, but I think on I'm, not, I'm, not talk, I'm, not, I'm not talking about from Spurs' point of view. I'm talking about from his point of view. Mm. Like, no, will I get he, that. You know, he's a human. Will he want to leave? He has to agree yeah. to it at the end of the day. Yeah, of course. But if if he can see that we're bringing in players in his position as well, mm. what's he going to think about that? 
Yeah, I agree. Maybe maybe you'll feel like he's uh, being left out in the cold. So I think Manuel Solomon, I, I personally, I'd want him to stay. But I do think like if we can get someone of Neto's quality in and use him as a make way, I, I do think it's probably the best option for all parties. And also, there are other options, not just Manuel Solomon. Like you say, Oliver Skip. And Oliver Skip's probably got um, bigger kind of transfer fee to his name or bigger, um, you know, you probably think he's probably worth 25, 30 million in the current market. I would say about 20 million, unfortunately. English tax as well. English tax. Brian Hill, could we throw him in? See what we can do. But what, what, we don't, I don't think we need to throw anyone in because I think we have the money, especially if we get Champions League football. Like, there's no reason to be hamstrung by the price. Obviously, I'm sure uh, Wolves will push for a higher fee, but you've got to remember, if they want to comply with FFP, that deal probably needs to be done before the end of June. So they might be forced to kind of accept a slightly lower fee than they want to, to to kind of get that money in. So it counts as the, the the current financial year. Yeah, I'm not saying it from our perspective how we if we need to throw in a player, but it could be attractive for Wolves' position because they're going to need to bring in a replacement mm. if he leaves. Yeah, that's a good point. So I'm looking at it and saying they'll probably prefer to deal with us if we can offer them someone in return than maybe someone else, another team. Yeah, 100%. But... I would love him through the door. I think if we, if we can get that done in the summer, that would be, especially if he can, you know, stay injury free or um, play a significant amount of games. I think we've got an unbelievable winger um, in our, on our on in our hands if we can get it done. That's the main thing, isn't it? Like, I don't think anyone has any doubts about the quality of the player. It's just the injuries are the only sticking point here in terms of whether uh, we make the move or not. But. Um, like I said in the last video, if he can prove his fitness from now until the end of the window, get 25 games or something above that but uh, behind his belt, in, in his legs between now and the end of the season, well, well, then from the start of the season yeah. to the end of the season, <laughs> mm. then I think that's a good amount of games. Mm. Let's talk about Conor Gallagher once again. And Sammy Mockbell says that Tottenham have a solid interest in Conor Gallagher and are open to negotiating a deal this summer. Should be available. It's understood that Gallagher would prefer to remain in the south of England if he were to make a move, leaving the door open to a possible move to Spurs despite the midfielder's Chelsea's roots. Yeah, we spoke about this yesterday. Again, it just depends on what the contract situation is. If he's putting his foot down on the contract. I heard, although I did read yesterday that Chelsea don't want to pay. The sticking point is Chelsea don't want to pay more than 150 grand a week. And he feels um, sorry to him because um, for any kind of new new contracts, they feel like that's the limit for for um, a player signing a contract, even though you got Enzo, Caicedo, all these other players probably are more than that. Um, they don't want to go above 150 grand a week. And Conor Gallagher wants parity with the best paid players because he's feel like, you know, he's been, he's been filling in as captain. He's been playing pretty much every game. He's been one of their most important players this season. So why shouldn't he have parity over uh, some other players just because he's not a brand new 50, 60, 70 million pound signing. But their top earner is Raheem Sterling on 325,000. I'm not sure if he wants that, but he wants more than 150. You know, he wants, I don't know what Enzo's on, but I think he like, you know, wants parity with some of their top earners in his position. I, I think Enzo's on about 170 or something like that. So I think uh, from what I read, he wants like 200, something like that. So are we going to offer him that? I don't no, know. No chance. I, I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we offer him, you know, between 100, 150. I don't see us going above a 150 for him. I don't even think we go to 150 for him, to be honest. I think we go to like max 125, 120, something like that. And I think that's what he's worth, to be honest. At this current rate, I think so. Uh, I, do, I do think he's a good player, but if he thinks he's going to not sign a deal with Chelsea and get a higher wage at Tottenham, I'd be very surprised if that is the case. Mm. Considering what yeah. our top earner is, Son with two hundred grand a week, two fifty. Yeah, is Son. I don't. Son's not even on that. Just he's yet, on two hundred. He? He's on two hundred because he is signed he a deal. 200? He signed a deal in uh twenty twenty one. I thought that was a deal to make him up to to one fifty, one sixty, one seventy around that. I think it's two hundred. I'll it? check it in a sec. But yeah, carry on with what you're saying. So I, I for for me, as much as I do, I think there is a chance we can do a deal with Chelsea. I don't. If Conor Gallagher thinks he's going to be getting a higher wage here than he would have got at Chelsea, I, I think he's dreaming a bit. One ninety. One ninety. Yeah. So okay. it's in the middle. <laughs> um, yeah. Look, I, I think when you're looking at the wages Spurs are offering at the moment, you're looking at Kulisevsky's on one ten, Christian Romero's on one six five, James Madison's on one seventy, Hugh Minson's on one ninety. So 
he's not going to be in the leadership team, so why should he be on pay parity with those kind of three players? So he should be in the ballpark below that, which is around 125, 130, around that kind of how, how much is Hoybier on? 100. So he exactly. So he's not going to be getting a lot more than that. Basically, you got to remember as well. Like we got some big, big wages off our books. Perisic, Loris, who got um, uh, Hoybiegs looking to leave in the summer. So there is going to be more kind of budget allocated to. Wages. I do. I agree with that. But imagine if he comes in and let's say we do give him one fifty. Ben Tenkul is going to want one fifty. Basuma, I don't know what they're on. He's going to want one fifty. Um, obviously, Madison's already on one seventy. But Saar, I mean, he'll probably want a new deal all of a sudden, even though he just signed one. Um, I think he's what on like forty five now. Um, so it does cause a few problems if he if we give him that kind of wage. And does he deserve a high wage from Ben Tenkul and Basuma? I don't know. Probably not. Rashalison is on ninety. Pedro Porro's on eighty five. You know what I mean? Like so, he should be on that level. Yeah. So I like if he thinks he's if he thinks he's going to come here and get more than one fifty, which nah, apparently no Chelsea chance. are offering. I don't think he goes anywhere and gets those wages. No one's going to pay him those wages. So he probably ends up siding. Yeah. But the problem is for him is he see he's at Chelsea where they're paying players more than that, and he wants he wants to be on parity with that because he feels like he's that important to the squad. But so I think in the end they probably will end up signing a deal. But uh, if if there is, there is a deal to be done with Chelsea if he doesn't sign, but whether we can pay Gallagher what he wants is another question. And I think he's worth more to Chelsea than he is to us being a Chelsea boy, a Cobham boy coming through the ranks there, you know, a lifelong supporter as well. I do feel like he's worth those wages more to Chelsea than he mm. would be to us. Yeah. Um, this is an interesting one. Let's talk about Frankie de Jong. Uh, up next, Gerard Romero, obviously a Barcelona journalist, says that Barcelona have received an offer from Tottenham Hotspur for Frankie de Jong. Operation around 60 million euros, including variables and a four-year contract for the Dutchman. The player would have the same salary as at Barcelona if he meets certain objectives, which is around 600 grand a week. Yeah, it can't, it can't <laughs> be. We're not, we're not paying anyone 600 grand a week. We could be going for Mbappe. We wouldn't offer him 600 grand a week. So... I mean, but then again, it does say if we meet certain objectives, I don't know what it means. If he if scores a hat, Champions League, if he scores a hat trick every week, then you're then you... a hat trick in the Champions League final. <laughs> yeah, if, he gets it. If he scores a hat trick in the Champions League final every week. That's yeah. what he needs. To do. <laughs> <laughs> that's what he needs to do to meet his objectives. Um, I do find it very, very difficult to believe that a player on his salary is going to be coming to join Tottenham. That he would be technically that's over triple currently our highest earner um, if he was to come. So. He can't be getting anywhere near that kind of um, wage if he comes to Tottenham. The only way I see any sort of possibility is if Barca really need the, need the money, they need to get rid of him because they're really struggling financially, and they're willing to supplement his wages while getting a transfer fee to try to get him off his books. But you're talking about maybe us giving him 200 grand a week and then hit them paying like the extra four or 500, which is a bit of a crazy situation. But um, unless that's the case... And then as well, I don't know, he gets a, a bonuses, maybe takes his, could take, potentially take his wage up to 300 grand a week or something with uh, with bonuses. I, I, I don't know. I think, I think it's too difficult financially. And then you add into the fact, look, I love Frankie De Jong. Is he the player we need? Um, I think, I mean, do, I mean, if, if, if Frankie De Jong's available, is it a question? Do you need him? Is it a kind of play you just get? Is he that good? Is he on that kind of level? I love Frankie De Jong. He's so good to watch. But some people are saying we just signed Frankie De Jong. Mate, Ollie, Ollie, <laughs> Ollie Skip ran rings around Frankie De Jong in the youth. You know what I mean? Exactly. Uh, but no, Frankie De Jong is obviously an unbelievable player, unbelievable talent um, at the right age as well. But with the finance involved, I, I just make it impossible an impossible deal to do. And I feel like if he is to come in here, and let's say this this report is true, and if he meets certain objectives, that he gets the same wage from Tottenham uh, that that he's getting at Barcelona, which I, I I find that completely hard to believe. But let's say that is true. You got to remember, you, you know, Son's on one ninety, but that is not including bonuses. He's probably on a lot more when you factor yeah, in bonuses. Fine, but let's say that this is true for a second. This report, and let's say like if he meets certain objectives, he gets that six hundred grand a week from Spurs. Mm. Does that not like upset the apple cart a little bit of of the Spurs squad where we've got a hierarchy and Frankie Dion? suddenly is going to trump all of that and be the top earner by miles at the club but i think that's what it, i think that this what it means it means he's the, his base wage probably maybe will be higher but it won't be it won't be like that much higher and if he if he meets it with bonuses i don't know how he meets these bonuses but if he gets it with the bonuses then he meets meets his actual wage that he's got like as i'm saying son is on 190 but if you if i think he's i think 
people used to say with Harry Kane yeah. that his bonuses used to take his wage up to a lot higher than his base wage. You mm -hmm. know, he was on 200 grand a week, but his, I think he used to end up on nearly 400 because of bonuses. So depends uh, in terms of the apple cart what his base wage is compared to his bonuses. That will be what, what upsets the apple cart. So maybe if he gets a base wage of near what Son's on, but then with bonuses he can get to his closest. I don't know. It still seems very difficult even on that front because how are you going to get 400 grand a week in bonuses? I mean, that sounds crazy. And what, like, Frankie mm -hmm. Young, he's not a player that, that scores loads of goals. I mean, he'll get a few... Pass like, completion you bonus. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> he, does he get, like, a pound for every pass he makes Every time he's press resistant, he gets a bonus. <laughs> you know what I mean? Every time he dribbles past and a player, also, he gets a bonus. we just signed Lucas Bergvall as well, who's the next exactly. Frankie Young. So we may as well just nurture him. He's better than Frankie de Young. <laughs> he's, he's a better version. Uh, look, mate, look, in terms of 60 million, that price is true. I mean, it's not a terrible price for him. It's a great price for him to sign someone of that quality for that much. It's just the wages are the sticking point here. Um, in terms but, of... Go on. But what I would say is if they're desperate to sell, right, De Jong's not getting that wage anywhere. I think it's crazy that he's on anywhere near that wage. I know he's a good player, but he's, he shouldn't be on that wage. Barca are nuts giving him that, that kind of wage. And if they need to sell him, then something has to give because... He, no one's paying 700 grand a week. No one, Man City wouldn't pay that much to him. Um, so he either has to take a wage cut or he or Barca have to supplement part of wages. Well, that's one of the things that's the moment if he is to leave or he just ends up staying. So something has to give. That's what's going to happen. He's going to end up staying. We've heard these rumours with Frankie de Jong. How many years in a row now that Barca want to sell him, Barca can't afford to keep him, Barca this, Barca that. And he ends up staying. He's, he wants to be a Barcelona player. Yeah. He, he, he loves Barcelona. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, there were all those rumours about Man United. I can't remember if it was last summer or the summer before. And it, the press were, like, certain that he was going to leave Barcelona. The press was certain that Barca were trying to push him out. But he was refusing to leave. Mm. And I imagine that's going to be the same case this summer. And why should he take a pay cut? Yeah. No reason to. Mm. He signed a deal. He's on an unbelievable wage. So, I don't know, I don't know how long he has left, left on this deal, but... Yeah, I mm. mean, we can check that, but I just can't see it. I, I reckon it's a long deal anyway. I reckon it's a really long deal. Like, Frankie de Jong's contract, how long has he been there for? It expires in 2026. Okay, that's another two years. Yeah, it's not, not a long at all, to be honest. So I reckon he digs his heels in at Barca for another couple of years and then probably leaves on a Bosnian. If he were to somehow make it work and sign him, where does he fit in? In the number six, in the number eight? I think he can play a hybrid of both. I think uh, Ange wants his midfield to be fluid and I think he fits the bill. Mm. I don't know if he's defensively good enough to be a six. But in the Premier League. Yeah, in La Liga probably. Maybe, yeah. Unless he's a six like, I don't know, Jorginho is a six, that kind of thing. But obviously, him and his, as an eight would be here. Imagine Basuma or Benton called De Jong, Madison, with Saar filling in. Oh, it's just uh, stuff of dreams. What would you feel like the, the, midfield, the midfielder that we desperately need is? Because we're looking at, in the, if, if you believe the rumours in the press, we're looking for an eight or a six or someone that can play a hybrid of both. Do you feel like we need one of those specialist sixes in? Uh, or do you feel like it's right to get one of these players in like a hybrid of the both? Um, it's very difficult to say. As Ange said in his press conference, they're not sixes or eights; they're just midfielders yeah. who have without attributes. And I think that's a good way of looking at it. In the, in especially in the modern game, do we need a specialist six? I mean, I don't know. I think Basuma is can do it. I think Bentancur can do it. I would like a player in terms of the eight. We have Saar, who's obviously unbelievable doing that eight position. We haven't seen Benten. We saw Bentancur in flashes do do a, a job there, but we don't know yet if he's uh, going to be when he's up to full fitness. I'm pretty sure he can do that role as well. So I think maybe someone who's more of a six but can also play an eight. Maybe that would probably be my preference. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move on and let's talk about this report from Alistair Gold talking about the Spurs squad at this moment in time. And he said, Ange Postacoglu hands responsibility for the environment in the dressing room to the players themselves, self-governed by Hyung min Son, vice-captains Romero and James Madison and the experienced heads such as Vicario, Eve Basuma, Ben Davis and Fraser Forster. Those inside the club say it's the tightest knit group there has been in a while with no cliques or diversions or, or divisions that, uh, thanks to a number of 
players who bring all the little groups together. And I imagine that is yeah. the kind of leadership group that do bring all the divisions together. Because you look at the leadership group and there's one in each division pretty much. Hyung Min Son is pretty much part of everything. Mm -hmm. But then you've got Kuti Romero, part of the South American Spanish contingent. And then you've got James Madison, part of like the UK contingent. Yeah. You also got people like Saar. He's friends with everyone. You've got Emerson. I bet he brings everyone together. Richarlison. I bet he's not a very cliquey person as well. So um, I absolutely love it. I think it's, um, you can see it on the pitch, how much they all, um, are, how, there's such a family feel with everyone on that pitch. It doesn't seem to be, Everyone seems to be as one. No one seems to be separated. Everyone seems to really adore each other. So I think it's evident with the way we play and, and how people are on, on the pitch. And that is very, very crucial. Maybe in the past it's been different, but at the moment, uh, yeah, that was absolutely great. And, you know, it's, it feels like, you know, you're getting that vibe back from peak Pochettino when the, the, the team were just so close to each other. And you've got to say, it's all down to the manager. Ange Postecoglou for creating this kind of vibe within the squad, vibe around the club. I mean, everything is just so positive at the moment. Yeah. Um, let's finish off talking about this Antonio <laughs> Conte interview. Talking about um, positivity, eh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, he did an interview with Matt Law with some really interesting quotes in there. And he says um, a couple of things I've just picked out from there. And he says, at the moment, my feeling was that uh, if I t he's talking about the uh, press conference he gave after the Southampton game, uh, obviously, which ended up being his last press conference as Spurs manager. And it says, at the moment, my feeling was that if I tell something, it means there's always something true. No, honestly, I don't regret anything about this, but I have good feelings about Tottenham. I keep that experience in my heart. Uh, then he asked if uh, he can be too honest at times. And he said... Um, I am this way. I hate the lies. This can help me sometimes or can sometimes hurt me, but I prefer to I prefer to stay in silent than tell a good lie. Also uh, with the relationship with my players during this season, um, it can happen and you need honest conversations that can be positive or negative. I know very well I was a player um, as well and some coaches told me good lies to keep me calm. I don't want this type of situation. I, I know very well when you have these honest conversations with players in the first moment they can be a bit angry. Then from my experience the time helps the player and, and then a prayer, the players start to appreciate you. They were angry but then they appreciated the honesty. For me, and then he's talking about... Um, him celebrating finishing in the top four and he says for me to celebrate fourth place a place in the champions league was really strange at the end of the final game against norwich i called my staff and said pay attention don't be used to celebrating a champions league place i was very clear i said we did the maximum from ninth to fourth that season but with all problems that we faced was a miracle but we didn't celebrate like it was a miracle because i'm used to winning <laughs> so what do you make out of all that do you think um it was the right thing for him to do th that press conference at the end of the Southampton game. I don't think the right thing to do is is, def is the right way to say it, but I, I think we all at the time were feeling a very similar way, and I think I don't think anything he said was untrue. And in a way, that moment was very much like a um, sliding doors moment in our in our club's history because it kind of felt like that was the moment we realised we're just going in the wrong direction. This is not. We we I think we don't have a squad with the right mentality to 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 deal with a manager like Conte. We need to go about rebuilding this instead of constantly trying to force winners into our into our team and try and build um the squad up to be better than it is. We need to completely tear things down. We need a complete rebuild of this team. We need a younger team. We can't think that we're going to bring in a Mourinho and Conte and they're just going to make the squad we have winners and winning trophies and challenging for titles just because of the way they are and that's the way we tried to run the club for a few years shoehorning winners into the team with like you know players who just weren't good enough well we obviously had Kane and Son who were great but the players around them weren't good enough to be where we wanted to be for a manager like that so that kind of moment kind of made us I think as a club realize we're, we've got this all totally wrong the last few years have been a complete waste of time and we just need a massive rebuild now um going in and now we're in a position where we are where we're really going in the right direction we've got a younger team we've rebuilt the squad and look when and we don't have that pressure of you know winning trophies or or or, or challenging for titles like we would do if we had like a Conte Mourinho in charge so that's the better direction we have to, for for the time being and I think, you know, a large part of it is because what happened in that moment when he gave hard truths to a lot of the squad and to the club, it felt, felt like. And it was true, but 
obviously when you're a manager of a football team and you know you, these players are supposed to be your players and you're supposed to back them publicly and you're not supposed to throw them under the bus that's not what happened so I can't really say it was the right thing to do but I definitely think in a weird way what happened probably benefited us in the long term yeah I agree <laughs> with that do you think like comments like that should be kept in-house and should be behind closed doors. Absolutely. Yeah, it should be, shouldn't it? I mean, I, at the time, I remember saying, like, I'm happy that Conte's come out and said this. I'm happy that it's public. I'm happy about all this because how many times can you drum things behind closed doors and then for the players not to realise and, and it not to work? But, you know, in hindsight, I think, yeah, he probably should have kept it behind closed doors, but it did make good viewing, didn't it, for the rest of the... <laughs> rest I, I, of the I, think, I think it was the wrong thing to do, but I'm happy he did it in a weird way. In, in I'm happy he did it because it was, it was the benefit of us long term. We needed to hear what he had to say. Yeah. That is truth. But he was wrong to do it, but I think it was, it was a good thing for the club in a weird way. But in terms of what you're saying about you know, the club needed a rebuild. We need to break things down um, from the bottom and, and build it up again. I mean, that rebuild started before even Conte came here. It started under Nuno when Fabio Paratici came. And you look at a lot of the players that are, you know, in the first team now with Destiny Udogi uh, came in when Conte was here. Um, and then obviously we loaned him back. Richarlison, uh, Pape Sarr, all these players that are doing so well now actually came in in that moment in time and maybe a bit before under Nuno as well. And... That's not what you want when Conte is your manager. When Conte is your manager, you need to bring in ready-made winners right now. So as much as it is, like, I didn't see the point of bringing in managers like Jose Mourinho, like Antonio Conte, when you're set up for a long rebuild. It just made no sense at the time. Yeah, but the thing is, it was a mishmash philosophy because we, ha saying. Because we had we had the, those players for rebuild, but also we had all these players which we were uh, having getting plasters over, long lay, Perisic. Matt Doherty, Perisic, um, you know, all like, you know, Dyer still being around, being well made centre back. Um, all these things. So Dan Juma on loan. Like we um there were there was no rhyme or reason to the way we were going. If you're gonna go to a rebuild, fully commit to it. Don't um half arse it like we were doing. And if you're gonna go the other way and and buy a buy team ready now fully commit to it. Don't be signing or a lot of these players who are just average and are only plasters and are only going to take you so far they're mid-table players. So we were kind of mishmashing it. It wasn't good for Conte. It wasn't good for us. And that's what led to us um, being so average for uh, for a long time. I know we got top four, which you know he mentioned, and it was a great achievement that we got top four when we did. Um, and uh, the fact that we, he took us from ninth to fourth in that period was a bit of a miracle, as, as he said. But... He isn't here to get top four. He doesn't manage clubs to get top four. He wants to achieve greatness. He wants to win titles. He wants to be competing right at the very top. And we were never going to do that with the squad we had unless we completely gave him a win now squad. You know, not Sessignon and Emerson and Doherty on the wings, not Dyer and Davis and Longley at centre back and Sanchez at centre back. That was never going to win you the but league. So the fact that we had that, it was always doomed to fail for Conte. But what happened, like, from that period to the start of the season? Uh, because we looked so good in the last like three, four months of that season when we got top four, we smashed Arsenal at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. And then everyone's expecting Spurs to kick on next season. And, you know, a lot of the fans were saying, all right, we're going for a title challenge next year. I think we even said that under Antonio Conte when he looked at the trajectory we were on, we looked at the way we were playing football. Everyone looked bought in to Antonio Conte's methods. What happened in, in that period of time? Like, why did it all go so sour so quickly? Well, you got to remember, I think come January, we were still, in the, I think we were third. We were actually had a fairly, we weren't in a title race, but we were, we were in a fairly decent position, but the performances weren't great. We know, we know that, but we weren't like in a bad position in the That's league. That's what I'm saying. Like, why did the performances drop off so well? Because we were playing so well in those last four months of the season. It's hard to say. I think that uh, maybe, obviously Conte went through a lot, not just uh, with, with the squad and his lack of maybe belief that this squad was able to compete, but obviously personally, yeah. he lost two friends. He had that surgery, which he alluded mm. to, which he said Daniel Levy, you know, really help, um, helped him recover and he wanted to come back quickly from it. Um, he went through a lot personally. And then on top of that, you know, let's be honest, as much like, as much as he performed a miracle, you're performing, perform, you're asking him to perform another miracle by getting us from, 
uh, you know, into the top four to a title challenge with the squad we had. It wasn't it wasn't sustainable. Maybe he just got us to overperform for a time, which was great. And then a lot of those players reverted to back to type, back to type mm -hmm. with the with their actual performance. And when that happened, that must have been very frustrating for Conte because he's trying to squeeze every last bit of uh, talent out of them, and it just only took them so far. And that was the reality. Yeah, it's interesting the the differences between Conte and Mourinho, isn't it? Because like Mourinho was like. Uh, Tottenham is the only club he doesn't feel something with and then Conte is saying you know I keep this experience to my heart and he has good feelings about Tottenham which is interesting um, but what we're saying that Antonio Conte was the best thing that happened to Daniel Levy to, for him to change course of action or change paths of the football club in a word in a weird way maybe <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about the best thing but I think definitely what happened uh, is now part of the reason why we are where we are at the moment yeah. on the trajectory we're on exactly so the best thing that could have happened to Daniel Levy in that moment in time he needed some home truths mm -hmm. uh, telling to him and I think Conte was the perfect man to give it to him to yeah. be honest because he's Conte was probably the only man to actually like just stand up and just not care what anyone thinks and just go right at it there are rumors that uh, Mourinho did it on his way out of Spurs but I don't think it was the same as doing it in the press as Conte did it mm. I think we all needed to hear, to hear it mm. but uh, that is your Tottenham update for today let me know in the comment section below your thoughts regarding all the news stories we brought to you today like subscribe and comment and as always come, come on, on you Spurs, Spurs.